But in either event, I, I think it, I disagree with the question, questioner um, who, who thought that we wouldn't have a price on carbon. I think among those set of countries, uh, we expect to have a price of carbon, um, and there's lots of support in those countries. The other option is, uh, that's, the first option is an option still, I think, consistent with 450. The second option is that, no, that a, world, a global agreement can't be reached. And in fact, uh, what ends up happening in it is there become a set of regional agreements, that that's the first step, the kind of practical, uh, perhaps, approach that Bill was talking about. In that scenario, the belief is that over time, the economics of this and the reality of the climate change will draw, uh, draw those various systems into linkage, that that's a possibility. In that case, you don't see a global price of carbon, but you do see uh, perhaps regional prices of carbon. Um, but that's not likely to be a system given the realities of uh, inertia and the climate system that's consistent with 450. You want to take something? Yeah. Uh, Oui, moi je pense euh, personnellement que l'effet le, euh, prix euh, peut changer les comportements. On en a d'ailleurs en France des très bons exemples avec la TIPP euh, différentielle entre l'essence et le diesel qui a conduit tout euh, le parc automobile et, et d'ailleurs le parc industriel des raffineries à s'orienter euh, vers, du, vers du diesel. Donc euh, historiquement, euh, on peut euh, changer les comportements euh, avec un effet prix. Le tout, c'est qu'il faut le faire en douceur et pas violemment pour que le consommateur puisse accéder quand même aux biens de consommation en question. Ceci dit, un effet prix, s'il est mal calculé, mal évalué, hétérogène géographiquement parlant, peut conduire à des effets pervers. Je reprendrai le même exemple. En France, cet axe différentiel mené trop longtemps a mené en fait, à rendre l'outil industriel de raffinage non optimisé par rapport à la ressource naturelle. Ce n'est pas ce qu'on veut d'un baril naturel de pétrole, on ne le transforme pas en ce qu'on veut, donc on désoptimise l'outil. Ce n'est qu'un exemple, il y en a des tas d'autres que vous, que vous connaissez euh, certainement. Donc, à un effet prix, je pense que c'est une des solutions. Il faut qu'il soit euh, équitable, euh, homogène, clair et visible sur le long terme. Merci. Uh, the gentleman over there and then Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Werner Weidenfeld. Uh the director of the Center for Applied Policy Research in Munich in Germany. Uh, first of all, I want uh, to thank for all this kind of wisdom which was shared with us this afternoon concerning energy. And, but in my mind, it's more or less on the basis of a technocratic rationality what we could listen via technological development, distribution, pricing, and so on. What I wanted to know in addition is, what do you expect about energy as an instrument of political pressure? Energy as a source of political power. Uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about this key dimension of world politics. So can you describe a little bit the landscape of future world political uh, conflicts on the basis of energy? Question mark. Thank you, Mr. Weidenfeld. Being Russian, I will not answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will probably relegate the pleasure to do it to uh, other participants at the panel. Please, maybe, maybe, well, maybe you will. Being seated in such proximity to a Russian, maybe I shouldn't answer the question either, but basically you've got uh, a number of things happening out in energy markets. Uh, where, the, where the markets are rigid, where they're tied together with grids, electricity grids, gas grids, you've got vulnerabilities. They could be political vulnerabilities, as we've seen. They could be commercial. They could be technical. Uh, they could be all kinds of things. The, the pipelines uh, into Europe run all the way from the center of uh, Turkmenistan. Those are old pipes, 30, 40 years old. Accidents happen. Uh, and there are other circumstances like that. It doesn't have to confer uh, a lot of political, geopolitical power on the, on the holders of the gas. In particular, I think gas markets are evolving in such a way that with increased LNG, the, the gas commodity is being commoditized around the world. Prices are moving together. There are influences that are shaping gas prices around the world. And people who think they can use gas politically are going to find out that people can get gas somewhere else, frankly. And over time, they will. Uh, you begin to see that already, although today's gas market is pretty unique. 
We'll have to be quite careful as we stitch, stitch together our electricity grids because we have to do that if we're going to take on more of this interruptible uh, renewables uh, energy, if we want to provide greater security to our rate base, we're going to have to integrate grids all the way across Eurasia and into North Africa. It only makes sense. And your, the United States that is divided up into East Coast, West Coast, and Texas is going to have to sort that out and create themselves a, a consistent grid. And that enhances the security of supply. I don't think anybody is in a real catbird seat on, uh, on energy. I don't think that Iran, Russia, and Qatar are going to get together and effectively establish a cartel. It's not in any of their interests. And so I think we can manage these things. Uh, we can manage these crises, and we can manage countries that think they have got the ability to use energy as a weapon. Yep. Um, I, yeah, I certainly agree with that answer. And I would just add that if one of the virtues of going to a very aggressive um, climate change mitigation policy and moving in the direction of 450 is, again, you're getting, first of all, a lot more renewables. So you're, it's, it's still a very fossil fuel future. It's got a lot of carbon capture in it, uh, but, it but it's still a fossil fuel future. But, but there'll be a lot more renewables, and that is a more diverse supply system. So that's somewhat more secure for, for countries. Secondly, it's a lot more energy efficiency, as I, as I showed in, uh, as I said earlier, a considerably more energy efficiency, which means that energy is a smaller contributor to the gross national product. Therefore, it's less, you're less susceptible. If what you're really concerned is about in, in an oil supply or other kinds of disruptions is, is, uh, is the economic effect of those activities, uh, the, the role of the energy sector would be somewhat reduced, again, moving in the direction of 450. You know, uh, I will add one small thing. In Russia, there is an interesting debate going on because this pressure thing is a two-way street. Some people say that we are too much dependent on the European market and it allows the Europeans to exercise pressure on us using this dependency. For instance, to China, the energy charter, which is for the time being not considered in, to be in the Russian interest. So people say, let's turn to China. And other people say, no, 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 we will de de depend too much on China. And China will certainly use this dependence against us. So I have to tell you that there is this uh, fear of pressure not only from the countries which produce gas, for instance, but those uh, countries who pr which produce gas, they also think about a possible pressure from the consumers. So this issue exists too. Uh, this gentleman well, over Mr. there Chair, wanted uh, to have a question. Just one issue. You see, this we are talking of international or bilateral pressures. But within countries, intra-country, Energy and politics is a very strong issue in developing countries. A lot of governments and political parties go to elections offering cheap energy or free energy. And those burdens come and fall on the, uh, the, the state exchequer. And ultimately, it also contributes to energy inefficiency. So there is one side are these international issues and pressures. The other is internal. Yes, energy is very much a political issue, I would say, particularly in democracies. Yes. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. So there is a gentleman here and a gentleman here. And I will call it a day. Please. Merci. Saïd Moulin, directeur général du Centre de développement des énergies renouvelables au Maroc. On l'a vu tout à l'heure dans la dernière session, si dans la, pour la crise financière, l'Afrique n'est pas responsable mais d'un autre côté, elle n'est pas trop touchée. Pour les changements climatiques, l'Afrique n'est pas du tout responsable, mais elle subit les conséquences des changements climatiques d'une façon dramatique. 